Uh, a newsroom in Waikato. Hello. Is this working? Yes. Excellent. Hi. So, despite getting in two days ago, I'm still really crazy jet lagged, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> um, So it's not like any of you know me, um, but you may have heard of uh, Next Day Video. So I run the Australian side of Next Day Video. We do lots of uh, conference recordings. So I record a lot of the PyCon Australia, PyCon New Zealand, a lot of that sort of region Python conferences. Um, I've also been a previous organiser of PyCon Australia. Um, I currently work for a company called Stocks Digital. Stocks Digital is a Australian company that writes about um, the Australian stock markets, so the kind of companies, activity, stuff like that. Um, the equivalent of it's uh, the ASX, so it's equivalent of your NASDAQ, basically. Um, I previously worked for a company called Gizmag, which were named New Atlas. You may not have heard of us, but you've probably read an article. Um, so Gizmag and New Atlas write about science, uh, tech, yeah, improvements to humanity. Um, very occasionally an article will go kind of nuts. So think sort of Engadget, Gizmodo, it's the same kind of site. Um, that was a Django-based CMS. Um, that got about 20 million uniques per month, um, but that was written from scratch. Um, so that was my previous job about a year ago. Um, this is a very short talk about building a new site in Wagtail. Um, everyone's experience is different. Um, the company I work for uh, writes about the Australian stock market, which is a very different sort of newsroom than your traditional sort of newsroom that might be writing about something different. So some of the experiences we've had are going to be the same, so they're going to be wildly different. Um, we're very, very niche. Um, yeah. Um, and new sites are kind of interesting because they seem simplistic, but once you get into them, there's lots of parts that are unobvious that you need to think about when you're uh, developing and working on a new site. Um, and obviously the challenges of a small newsroom is going to be different than a big one. So Stock Digital is fairly small. I think there's about eight or nine journos total, some on contract, uh, which is very, very different than a newsroom with, you know, like dozens or hundreds of journalists. So again, our experiences will be a bit different than a larger newsroom, but there's certainly things in common. Um, so this talk is really about our experience using Wagtail for a multi-site um, uh, inst use instance. Um, and the challenges we have moving forward, things that Wagtail currently doesn't do that I would love for it to do. Um, we have a number of publications. Um, I'd imagine no one here is a speculative investor interested in the Australian stock market. So we won't talk about the brands, we'll talk about the actual tech. Um, this is the end result of one of our sites, so FinFeed. Uh, is one of our sites. That's all Wagtail. Um, so a newsroom, a new site typically has something like this. Um, and we've got three different brands, or three different sub-brands, um, or sorry, six different sub-brands. Um, but you typically have things like a section, um, a subscribe panel, uh, very important for these sites to get subscribers. Um, you want to promote articles, stuff like that. Um, articles will often have a hero image, so each article has a uh, required image that basically displays in lots of places, so things like Social media, um, you know, your main page. If I can alt tab. Um. That's the site here. So these change effectively, and that's all dynamic based on the image uploaded into the Wagtail. Um, and that's all dynamic. Um, other things a um, new site will have. Um, is a way to pin images at the top of the site. So these are basically uh, defined by the editor as in the actual articles they want to promote primarily. And that links to other things like our newsletters and stuff like that. Uh, could maybe do this. Sorry. Cool. Um, that's an article page. Um, so an article will have a bunch of metadata, some which is obvious, some which isn't. So you'll typically have a headline, an author, a date, a section or category. Sometimes you can have multiple categories. Um, you have a here image, which I spoke about before. So that one image is used everywhere on the main page in uh, open graph tags or social media, various other places where uh, news is aggregated. Um, special flags, things like editor's pick, uh, trending, stuff like that are typically flags in an article. Uh, body, you've got things like embeds, images, stuff like that. Um, you've got a published date, which might be different than the last modified date on the article. Um, you've got a company. So a lot of the stuff we write about is about a company, so we want to keep that metadata for reporting reasons. Um, most traffic to a news site is typically either promoted or through aggregated through something like Google News. So you actually want to capture people's attention. Typically they won't go to your front page and then go to a sub, uh, an article. They'll generally land directly in an article. They'll read it. They'll close it off. 
So you generally do things to try to keep it on your site. So this is a um, little widget that basically grabs, uh, there's a little bit of logic in the back end that grabs another Wagtail um, article within a certain criteria and will promote it on the site, and that changes in every load. Sure. Um, so we have a bunch of different brands. Um, each brand basically lives in the same Wagco instance, and we've done things like, uh, which I'll go through my next slide, um, use inheritance. So we have a, a, a article uh, model which is inherited from page, and we do things like common templates, common logic. Uh, it basically means we're going to make changes to one site and it reflects everything. Um, I'll talk about some of the challenges in doing that. Um, Next Investors doesn't show a little folder because that's basically just standard Wagtail site. That's uh, sorry, standard Django site using uh, URLConf. Um, so nothing particularly special there. Um, combined traffic to these is about 350,000 unique visitors a month, so not that big, but enough that there's certainly performance challenges we've had to overcome. Um, why Wagtail? Um, I joined the company about a year ago. Um, they currently had all their sites running on, on WordPress and every site was set up differently. Um, it was meant to be consistent, but there's lots of plugins like Gravity Forms and other bits and pieces that just trying to get structured data out of it is a complete nightmare. Um, I wanted a Django-based CMS, slightly biased, been a Python developer for like 15 years, uh, used a Django-based CMS in my last job. You know, I wanted, I wanted to be able to write a CMS that was explicit, um, and I'd used Wagtail previously at a previous job, not for a new site, it was for more like an educational site, but uh, I certainly understood its uh, pros and cons. Um, we are uh, writing about the financial um, sector. We actually have um, uh, legal compliance requirements because um, it can be obviously kind of hairy if you do the wrong thing there. So we want to enforce that certain th that an article goes through a certain workflow. We know that things being published or legally correct, there's no in, in, you know, incorrect information and stuff like that. Um, doing that in WordPress is kind of interesting. Obviously, writing around explicit CMS and something like Wagtail, we can enforce this stuff. Um, the editors will define a style guide. We can start enforcing some of that stuff to the CMS as well. So all sorts of uh, more blue sky sort of thinking, but stuff we can do. Um, and we also need a report and some stuff too. So we have some internal reporting tools based around what we're doing um, to kind of give the uh, editorial team some focus. Again, trying to get structured data out of WordPress is a bit of a nightmare. Uh, doing it in Wagtail is much easier. Um, and my grand plan is to bring journalists into the CMS earlier. So um, typically when a journalist coming from, I guess, more of a print mentality, write a piece. They're thinking about the actual piece itself, not thinking about metadata that's important for promotion. Things like the small excerpt that will appear in search engines, uh, the images used, uh, you know, things like tags. Things that are really, really important when you're promoting your content um, that if you're writing an article outside of a CMS, you're not necessarily thinking about. Um, so bringing a journalist in earlier into Wagtail hopefully would uh, assist with that. And uh, having bought CMSs for previous new sites, um, I know that works. Um, building the site, so we took about a month and a bit to build the first site, which was a lot quicker than I expected, which was nice. Um, we looked at a few things. I originally took all the images from WordPress. I uh, dumped out the database, and it was interesting. And every instance was different. So we took the other um, mentality of actually, WordPress has a REST API that gives you kind of the rendered content. Um, so basically using that, iterating through each article, doing some data sanitization, doing lots of data, data, data sanitization because uh, it was all over the place, um, and doing things like taking the images and actually creating a, a, a Wagtail image and storing it all properly. So the data is really nice and consistent. And a lot of our sites um, might have information about the stock code of the, the company, you know, how they're performing, stuff like that. So actually using beautiful suit to actually pass it out and keep it a structured data inside Wagtail was really nice. Uh, so we can do smarter things with our data rather than just being content, you know, in a blog basically. Um, we did some funny things, so every site was set up differently, so like, you know, we had a section slug and an article slug, some had a date, some didn't have a date, some sites had subsections, some didn't. Um, so the default logic in Wagtail is typically to follow your structure you define in your UI, and it will generate the URL like that. We ended up having to override URL path conditionally. And as we added each site, um, I think the first site took about a month and a half, the next site was about a month, the next site was about a month, and most of that wasn't actually built, because we are using the same templates and just building on top of it. It was uh, dealing with kind of trying to do it elegantly in a way that you could actually um, have multi-site, um, multi-site functionality in a way you could actually make changes to the base site and have everything reflected. Um, we really have a complicated this. So the set your all path ended up being this crazy thing I'll show, I'll show you guys later. Uh, we're, we're a radical page at the time, that would have made our lives much, much easier. Um,
Cool. So I've lots of attempts we end up with this, basically. So we hear it from Paige. An article, I, it's red and green, intentionally red code, green code. Um, article has a whole bunch of logic in there. Um, things like, you know, site-specific fields, custom validations. Um, we have things like a hero image and some metadata required on our sites to ensure that, you know, we, we meet compliance and the article looks nice. Um, journalists complained when they were doing drafts inside the editor that they had to put this data in there and add images before they could actually save a draft. So we do things like actually define um, arbitrary validation um, on save, sorry, on publish rather than save. And putting it up there is really, really nice. Everything else gets it for free effectively. Um, we also do that so we can lock down where the pages appear. So using parent page types and subpage types, uh, we can actually say which site a article has to appear on so we don't end up with weird articles and weird spots. Um, and having it uh, in here, it means that we know, for example, we're using an API to actually um, talk to an external reporting suite. We know there's always going to be certain fields always available. Um, Um, in production, so um, any of you using Wagtime production, none of this is a surprise, but uh, coming from WordPress, this is a huge difference. We can have ability to ship multiple changes per day. So previously, the team, I think, would do a release every two weeks and hope nothing would break. We just release stuff, you know, as it gets approved for the PRs, which is really nice. Um, we've got a full CL of the test suite. So again, tests were unheard of previously. We have full test coverage now, which is well, full-ish, as it always is, um, using Docker and ECS. So everything's containerized, which makes things nice and easy. We're also doing alternative page renderings. Um, so things like Ant, Apple News, stuff like that all comes out of Wagtail. Um, and we're also doing things like J JSON, LD JSON open graph tags. So you guys aren't familiar with this. Um, what's important when you're promoting articles is... Um, oh, sorry, I should sorry the other site. So that's FinFeed. I meant to show you this before, I forgot. Um, on the site. Um, like so, images, data, actually this one doesn't have one, so go figure. Interesting article I picked as well. Uh, that one. Yeah, so an image, so FinFeed articles are very different. So typically they'll basically be generally unformatted text, which makes this easier and harder in some ways, but I'll run through that later again. Uh, we have links, all the usual kind of stuff, images, headings, stuff like that. Uh, Catalyst Hunter, again, that was the first time we converted over. Very, very simple heading. Um, there's some metadata up here, which we normalize that when we converted it over. So the company name, their stock code, you know, um, that sort of speaks about the kind of risk involved in the stock. Um, these are really, really important. So on our, all our assets, we have these things that get either pushed in. So we've rewritten the rich text uh, template tag to actually arbitrarily insert these into certain parts of the content. Um, um, we don't like pop-ups because they're horrible, but obviously, you know, making, um, getting people's Information is really, really important in terms of um, promoting content. <coughs> and this arbitrarily inserts it based on some rules. Um, and the other side as well. So again, very simple stuff in the front page. And it cross-promote sites. Um, to show you the OG tags, which I haven't put up, that I had. Ah, here we go. Great. So these are really, really important. So you've got things like um, open graph tags. So things like Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, use these. And you basically define things like when an article is published, um, you know, the URL to it, the actual URL, the image to use, uh, the width and the height, stuff like that. So if you want your stuff to appear really, really nice on social media when people share your link, you need this sort of stuff in it. Um, what else we have? We also have LDJSON. So this is a spec um, that Google released that basically gives you, it basically gives Google better ability to index your content and other sites that support this as well. Um, there's a huge spec on it. It's massive and ridiculous, and not many places implement it fully. Um, but we found this has been really key to actually get our stuff aggregated in more places. Um, again, this is sort of stuff that's not very obvious, but you really want it for a new site. Um, we added some custom functionality, so um, we want either, uh, we generally want external review by a compliance team. So we've got a little thing there we've built that basically generates a UUID for each article uh, based on a revision, and we basically send that link to an external person that allows them to review the actual link without actually having to log in, which is really nice. Um, just something we haven't had before. Um, they used to email um, Word documents, which is very different than what you see in the actual site. And uh, legal compliance want to see how it actually look on the actual page itself. So this has been really nice to do. 
Um, we implemented our own uh, draft type image element, so we migrated the draft type probably about a month ago. Uh, one of the things we discovered was right now draft type doesn't give you the ability to actually um, have an image with a link. Um, I believe it's due to atomic blocks, but I think that might be just not implemented yet. We also had some complaints from staff that adding images was kind of clunky to do. Um, I didn't agree, but I took their comments and so we ended up building this basic building in about two or three days. So if I can show you, it's effectively a custom um, image uh, embed that lets you um, search the existing images um, and upload all of them with very minimal clicks, basically. Um, So, you can drop on an image, replaces the, um, the standard image embed, an image, this is all React with a single API added. You can search existing images, you can upload a new one, you can also paste an image as well, which is, I'll show you guys later. Um, select, give it a caption, which is required, um, give it a link optionally, and resize it. So this is something they, um, writers were saying that quite often they would uh, author content, and uh, they didn't know how wide or small an image would appear. So we built this thing that basically gives them the ability to see how wide or narrow an image is. Which again, really simple stuff, but it just helps the journalist actually author content in a way that's really palatable when it's published. Um, and again, this has really convinced me with Drive Tales way forward, because this took about two or three days to build total. Um, and that was with no experience with previously, which was nice. Wrong one. Cool. Um, and now that the staff know we can add new custom functionality fairly quickly, the issue I'm now dealing with is kind of keeping back the requests. Very different than before, which is nice. Um, yep, going through that. Um, bumpy bits. So hello.js was a bit of an issue initially. It wasn't bad, but we tend to find, and I'll run through this later, but quite often our journalists will actually paste in um, content from externally sourced uh, Word documents, things clients sent them, you know, various kind of sources that kind of have really bad formatting. Um, and they pasted it into hello.js and it used to do weird things like wrap everything in a H5 tag, which you couldn't remove. You could actually lock down the rich text editor to be like, these are the only the elements we want to do. So it only give us an H2, a H3, a link, stuff like that. But it would actually let you paste in stuff that you couldn't remove. Um, so we end up basically in the save method for articles, you used to do lots of data sanitization. Just, we had to, it's the only way to get data in there effectively. Uh, with Drafter, we've written a lot of it out. Like, it's just better out of the box, which is awesome. Um, the custom URL logic, so again, I think that was a snuffer on our end, but we end up doing lots of custom URL handling logic based on, you know, we had different URLs from the start of the sites we converted back from. Again, we didn't know about writable page, and that probably would have made a big difference. Um, things like, uh, yeah, so we want to prevent articles from being deleted by either editors or writers. We want to be able to unpublish a page, not delete them. And that was something I would expect to be supported out of the box. We couldn't find out how to do it. That doesn't mean we, you, you can't do that. We just couldn't figure out how to do it. So we ended up basically doing a bunch of CSS hacks and a bunch of permission hacks. Uh, the primary problem with that was I think you could disable it, but you, the permissions weren't granted enough. So we wanted to do it based on specific groups, and I think it was either a global or a off if I recall correctly. And um, things like AMP or alternative rendering. So AMP is a... Is a I'm not going to say a subset of HTML, but it's an alternate version of HTML that Google News, for example, will use to promote your news piece. And it's done in a way that um, is, uh, that's not true, it's also used normally as well. So when a mobile phone is used an AMP page, an AMP page basically is a subset of HTML that basically is designed to be rendered very, very rapidly. So lots of things are not allowed. Um, and uh, with my previous job, we stored stuff in Markdown or similar. Um, so we just basically had a different sort of uh, transformation. What we do with AMP is basically take the uh, HTML that's stored inside the, um, inside the database and basically munge it, which is not ideal. And occasionally when someone in manages to put a tag in that's not supported and it all blows up. Um, so it'd be awesome to fix that. Um, you know, um, the other thing we had challenged with is multi-site. So um, this is something I've dealt with a few times now. So. Um, uh, domains typically environment specific, so if you set up Wagtail sites, uh, it's very based around the host name and the port. Um, and if you move it to a local dev environment or somewhere else, it all goes <laughs> um, It also doesn't give a canonical universally accessible slug. Actually, canonical is incorrect. I should have used, uh, what's the word I used? Uh, semantic, sorry. 
Um, so basically you've got a PK, a domain, and a port, and a human readable name. They can all change. So if you've got bits in your code that are conditional based on that, and you change your site name or the domain or something like that, they will break. Um, conditional views, conditional logic inside of views can get kind of hairy as well. Because um, again, you're checking things like either a PK, which is not very readable, what does that mean? You're checking for like a human readable name, you're checking for a domain name. Again, it's not a really easy way to do it. Um, and it's limited helpers as well. So one of the biggest challenges you get is get an absolute URL in Django gives a relative URL. So you're doing multi-site, like what site is this for? What's a domain name? You end up with all these really sort of hacky kind of solutions there. Um, so we've got a thing called site data, um, which basically gives you the ability to define um, a semantic multi-site setup. Um, so you use a label and everything comes off that. Um, I'm not gonna go that too much, because uh, the talk's not about that, but it, it basically provides a whole bunch of um, uh, convenience methods. Things like reverse, get absolute URL, just work and give you the actual full URL. Um, we define it in settings.py. The reason why we do that is um, you generally aren't changing your site data very often. Having an ORM hit every single time is kind of bad because you do a per HTTP request. And then there's ways to solve that, but there's caches and then you've got more problems. So um, this gives you a way to basically add arbitrary uh, metadata about a site into a settings.py, which is initialized at Django runtime. Um, and then you can basically access that. So site data comes up as request.site data that gives you a lot of this data as basically as, uh, as uh, attributes or properties um, and also provides a bunch of convenience methods as well. Um, so in your, temp in, your, um, in your templates, you can do things like uh, request.site.data.sociallinks.facebook, which is way more readable than having conditional logic in there. Um, you also have a, have, a, um, have a template tag called URL FQDN, um, which basically wraps around URL, but takes two um, attributes, takes either site data or URL conf. So it basically lets you create a full URL for the entire domain, uh, which again is much, much nicer than the normal ways you do it. Um, you can also do things like actually reuse class-based views or pages without having to define one for every single subsite as well. Um, so there's a mix in, or well, not mix in, it's inherited, but yeah, you can basically define a, a dynamic template name and things just work. Um, I should release this at some point, um, but yeah, this is a, a pattern that works really, really well for us. Um, other challenge we've had too is, um, I don't know if anyone else has hit this, but this is a challenge we've certainly had, is renditions. Um, lots and lots of SQL requests. So we had, um, I think this is an article with like something like 30 or 40 images in it. And it was something like 80 SQL queries, because it gets, oh no, sorry, this had 55 SQL queries, so 15 images inside the rich text field. So I did 15 images with 15 image renditions. Um, Django has some nice tools to do that, like select related and prefetch related. Um, we do some stuff which, again, there might be easier solutions for this. I'd love to hear from people. But we basically, uh, we hijack the route or serve pattern, implement our own get children for render, which basically does things like select related and pure related. We also store the PK of the images on the actual page or article model directly as well, which, again, just means it's much, much more efficient. Um, again, um, there might be better ways of doing this. Maybe I misunderstood something. But we were just finding that every single HTTP request to uh, our Wagtail sites was resulting in lots and lots of um, SQL requests. And even though we can wrap, uh, do things like uh, lazy uh, views and template fragment caching, um, you add a cache and you've got more problems. So I tend to avoid caching unless I absolutely have to. Um, and database is actually fast, surprisingly. So, um, so after those optimizations, we get 22 queries in about a quarter of the time. Um, which again can be optimized further, but that was just a few, a few, a few tricks which I just spoke about. Um, something a lot of people don't look at, but Django debug toolbar is your friend. Looking at SQL queries um, is a really useful thing to do. Um, recommend it heavily if people don't look at it at the moment. Um, right, so things we haven't solved yet. Um, so I wanted journalists to use the CMS directly. Um, we made a really nice looking, I'll show you a picture. We made a really nice looking um, editor. Um, they're again, they'll use the WordPress or other systems that let you do absolutely anything to formatting, which is a double-edged sword, because you can do anything you want, but you don't want them to do anything they want. So, you know, we had a lockdown, so only H2, H3s are allowed. Um, you know, it, it really is easy to use editor, effectively. And we gave it to them, and they're like, nope, which was really surprising. Um, these are some features that Wagtail doesn't currently have. Um, and we... Um, I thought this was a solved problem because that new Atlas, we actually built a custom CMS editor and all the writers used it. And I thought, fantastic, everyone's using the CMS early, they're writing pieces in it, they're getting it reviewed. This is a solved problem. It turns out it's not a solved problem. Um, 
Lots of journalists write in things like Microsoft Word and copy and paste. And no matter how much you try to get them out of Microsoft Word, they love Microsoft Word or some other tool. And I run through as, as to why that is. Um, so it was surprising to me. So, um, so a simple editorial workflow, um, which is probably what most people think would happen, was a writer submits an article into the CMS, editor reviews it, might make some changes, and then they publish it. That's probably the most simplistic uh, workflow, um, which usually doesn't reflect reality. Um, every workflow, uh, sorry, every newsroom is different, and they often got insanely complicated workflows. Um, there's another one. Um, so you've got a writer submits an article. Um, you have a photographer who submits images separate to the writer. Um, an editor reviews that. A chief editor will double check it, and then they'll publish it. Um, this obviously doesn't include things like data going back to the writer as well. So again, this is a very, very simplistic kind of example of a workflow. Um, another one. So an editor might assign a story in a due date to a writer. And for example, we have a legal compliance. So before anything is published, it has to go through legal compliance. If they knock it back, it goes all the way back to the start again. Um, another one. You know, I can go on and on and on. And again, this is simplistic. Um, some news and workflows are crazy complicated with lots and lots and lots of steps. Um, doing this in Wagtail is kind of difficult because you've kind of got the idea of a draft and then a publish. These are, all these other states are not currently supported. Um, yeah, there's another one. So this might be an advertorial piece, for example. So it's something effectively is like a written piece that's uh, promoted. Um, so on top of the legal compliance, for example, it was, a, it was a, a financial article, you also might want clients to approve it as well. And again, if a client rejects it, it might go all the way back to the start again. So crazy sort of number of steps there. Um, these are the features that writers and editors want in, their, in what they write into. They want the ability to have revisions, so go back and actually view all the changes to an article. They want to be able to comment on an article. So an editor might go through and be like, can you change this, you know, can you reword this, stuff like that. They want to be able to track their own changes. Now, that's, this one was enlightening for me, is I always saw track changes a bit like the way Google Docs does it. Like, I want to track the changes that someone else has made to my document. Lots of journalists will basically go through, write a bunch of paragraphs, go back, change it, and they actually want the ability inside their, um, their editor to actually do this and see their own changes as they're working on it. Um, they want an offline save draft. So if they're writing directly to a CMS and they get knocked offline, they don't want all their article, all their work to go and uh, disappear. And you want to be able to have configurable workflow and rules. So um, like I explained, having a simple workflow, adding more steps is not sufficient. Every newsroom is different. So you want to be able to have different approval steps based on the requirements of the newsroom. And uh, with us, for example, we've got six different publications. Um, and each one of those has a slightly different compliance um, and review framework. So even for us, even on the same instance, we'll have different rules. Um, they don't necessarily need or want real-time collaborative editing. That's a cool feature, but it's kind of hard to do. Um, and a lot of journalists don't actually want that. They want clean versions of every revision. Um, and a newsroom schedule, which is part of our newsroom workflow, um, is out of scope for Wagtail. So where I see Wagtail comes into it is basically putting content in or putting content together. Um, working out when that content goes in is sort of out of scope. Um, what does Wagtail do currently? So we have basic revisions. So we've got that. So different revisions of a single piece. You then click compare with previous revision and you get that. So that was me, uh, which is the really cool thing about this though, is it actually gives you, um, it tells you exactly what changed in any single uh, field on the model. Um, but that's not very readable though. That was me, I think, changing two words and deleting one paragraph. And it's just, that's hard to read. Um, Google Docs, for example. Um, off. It's going off. Um, Google Docs are something like this. So um, you can basically click on every single revision. I mean, a lot of people probably use Google Docs, so you're familiar with this, but you can click on every single revision there and see exactly who changed and what changed. Um, something like this for Wagtail would be awesome. Um, again, the states are fairly simplistic. So you've got drafts, scheduled, and live only, um, which again works for um, lots of content strategies, but uh, for a newsroom, it's not sufficient. Um, what we can do at the moment, which we do for some of our, our uh, some of our sites, is we actually lock down publish on editors group only. So we haven't enforced kind of like the, the writers will put it into the CMS. That can't actually make it go live or publish it. The writer, so the editor actually has to look at it. But again, feedback is kind of hard. Feedback is done either in person or by email. Uh, it's a very decoupled process. Um, 
There's some parts here from Ragtile Core Models .py. Um, I'm not a core developer, so I don't know, but from what I can see, that's kind of the understanding of the current state of the page at the moment. Um, there are ways we can build this that are kind of hacky and keep state separately, and I don't really want to go down that path, so I suspect doing this well will require some changes in core, um, but I'd love to talk to other uh, developers about the best way of approaching this. Um, commenting is another feature. So um, being able to comment on a piece, or not necessarily making changes, but being able to comment on a piece and say, hey, you know, let's look at changing this and have a discussion around it. Um, that's something else that writers use a lot. Um, um, the challenge with Wagtail, though, is it's like a Google Doc or a Word document is kind of like a big, rich text field. Wagtail has other fields, and you want to be able to comment or add revisions to lots of different fields as well. So there's a UI challenge here in how we do this. Um, but again, this is something that I believe a lot of people would uh, gain benefit from. Um, tracking changes. So that's one of our documents. You can see how many changes there are. There are a crazy amount. Um, being able to review that and see exactly what's happening is useful. Um, also, track changes are something that writers will do even on their own piece, like I explained. So quite often they might write a piece out. That paragraph doesn't seem right. I want to go back and rewrite it again. They'll go back and rewrite it again. Oh, uh, you know, I actually like that. So they actually want to go through kind of piece by piece and actually approve or, or deny their own changes even. Um, also, you might notice there's images inside the document. So um, this, this workflow of writers using Word and then copy and pasting into the CMS is something that I don't like, but it's something that happens a lot in lots and lots of newsrooms. Um, there are other tools out there I've found. Um, or, or used in the past, but they're very, very decoupled. So basically, they're kind of these cloud suites or proprietary suites that will uh, aid a, a, a journalistic team of through authoring content, approving content, and then putting to the CMS as a distinct separate step, um, either done through an API or something like that. Um, yeah. um, what open source solutions already exist? Not many. Um, there are some proprietary cloud tools that basically will help, again, a team pull together content. Um, but it basically means no one's using Wagtail's excellent admin. And I know we certainly use it because we can do all sorts of awesome stuff. And uh, using Wagtail, not using its admin, to me, seems like a real cop-out. Um, it's also unlikely to support custom embeds. So we've built that custom image embed, for example. Um, and the way that other, the way these suites work is they generally will pre-render the HTML and stick it into the, 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 the database of the CMS. Um, so it's very, very unlikely that one of the powerful things about Wagtail is a bit of the customized stuff. Uh, you would lose all that, which is not good. Um, bigger newsrooms often build their own CMS and workflow. So this seemed to me like it should be a solved problem, and it actually kind of is. Um, some examples, I mean, these are from 2014, so they're four years old. Um, but the Guardian bought their own uh, CMS, um, and it's got a lot of this stuff there, like track changes, commenting, stuff like that. Um, I found many, many examples of this. It seems like lots of large newsrooms build their own CMS as kind of like they're a competitive edge. It's their way of, um, you know, authoring better content effectively. And even though parts of it are, are open sourced, I'm not seeing any full solutions. Um, another example is New York Times. Again, this is from 2014, so I would imagine this is very different now. Um, but they even say things here like, our editors prefer will demand word style track changes of the text editing. So, you know, very common theme here, right? Um, again, they've open sourced a thing called Text Editor called ICE, but the GitHub repo seems to be about two or three uh, years out of date. Um, again, maybe I'm not looking in the right spot. Um, and obviously, one of the solutions here would be to replace uh, Drafttail. Um, well, 33 minutes. I'm going to speed this up, sorry. Didn't realize I have. Um, yeah, um, one of the ways we're going to actually publish is with our editor effectively. and. What are editor and basically replace Drafttail, but again, Drafttail is excellent. Uh, it seems like the sort of thing that would be awesome to add. Um, yep, and as I mentioned, even the best CMSs. So I've spoken to journalist friends who work at some of these larger publications, and even though they provide a really awesome interface, they seem to like use Word or their own favorite word processor anyway, um, and they'll copy paste it into the CMS when, um, you know, when, when it's time to review it effectively. Um, something, oh, yeah, features right as expected as a result. Something I wanted to show you guys as well is actually how well Drafttail does this. Um, actually, in fact, I'll skip this. Sorry, I didn't realize I've stood three minutes, and so apologies. Um, yeah, so our current Wagtail workflow is basically the writing team draft comments in a word processor. They use uh, track changes, comments, a document management system to track the revisions. 
Um, when the piece is actually done for approval, then it goes into the CMS, and there's a uh, dedicated publishing team to do this, uh, which is again is very very normal for small 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 newsrooms. Um, something we do, which is kind of naughty, which I wanted to demonstrate, is we uh, if you can see that or not, um, but we're using a rich text for the body, um, which is a no no because uh, stream fields are awesome. It's the one reason I was actually drawn to Wagtail in the first place. Um, but we tried stream fields and the journalists didn't like it. And I actually wanted to demonstrate as to why that was. Um, stream fields are great. Um, it does say using them for news stories. Um, slightly controversial, but I, at the moment, don't necessarily agree. Um, but again, maybe I'm doing something wrong, so please educate me if that's the case. Um, I go here. So, where are we? Um, so if I go to pages, for example, let's go to here. Let's go to here. So we've got the article, we've got the metadata about there. Um, we've got the body here. So if I go back here again, So here is the document we had earlier. Word decides it wants to move its over. Sorry. Wow. Not letting me move it over. How do we use computers? Here we go. Sweet. So this is basically a Word document. Um, the Word document has things like images, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, previously, I had a lot of issues with this. But um, and you can see as well, um, I can't even use Word. Either way, copy, paste. It's come through brilliantly. So H2 tag, stuff there. Very, very minimal uh, munging of data. Draft, how uh, dot draft. The old one, sorry. What was the audit, the audit called again? Oh, hello. hello. Hello, that's the one. Yes, hello didn't do as good job as this, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, images are fairly easy. So we actually got a feature now that basically lets them grab the image. Oop. Copy. You can actually paste the image in. You can upload it. You can also copy and paste stuff. So if, right, if I want to go through and change stuff, really easy to go through and copy and paste this, including the image. Very easy to use. If I want to change, move around headers, it's great to use. Um, again, maybe I'm doing this wrong, um, but the equivalent using stream fields, so heading, paragraph, image, embed. Let's put a paragraph in. Oop. So then if that plus, add a heading, copy and paste this in. Um, things like images, obviously, you can't copy and paste like I did before. So. Um, even though trim fields are awesome, and I use them in a lot of situations, we tend to find for the body of an article, they're much more cubersome to use. Um, this might be something we can improve in a future update, I, I don't know. Um, sorry, let's try to finish up. Um, yep, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Sorry, any questions? Sorry, I'm conscious I've gone way over time. I apologise. Hey. Very important question. Did the image um, change the size of the image? Uh, no, but we might have open source it. So, yep. But I, I guess the powerful thing about that is it took us like two or three days to build it. Like, it was awesome how fast it was to actually build that thing and have it work. So, 
The multi-site thing, is that also something custom that you built? It is, I'm, I'm gonna open source that, so. Oh, awesome, yeah. I definitely... <laughs> yeah, it solves a lot of problems for us, which is really good. So at the moment it's a manual thing, but we're building a back end for it. So yeah, it's a manual thing. So every day the journalists go through and basically look at the statistics and actually update it. But we have a we have a separate application that aggregates data from Google Analytics. So we're just going to create that brand API and actually pull data out dynamically every hour. So it's not the intention to kind of turn that into an automatic system. Yes, correct. Yes. Yeah, I guess the big goal for us, the overarching goal of using Wagtail is to kind of automate human things. So a journalistic team or editorial team will do lots of things by hand. We're just trying to get rid of that all, just have it all just happen by itself. And we've done a lot already. And this has only been, we started developing this in I think September, October last year. So there's a lot that's got done in that period of time. Any other questions? What, what are the capabilities in terms of, um, something of content um, in terms of SEO? Uh, how do you mean, sorry? Uh, sorry, I'm not understanding the, the question. URLs. For the URLs? Yes. You talking about the metadata where we're populating on the page, or? Uh, where are you populating? Um, uh, I, I thought I saw a slide at some point that said that um, the URL was populated through. Oh yeah, we, 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 use, we use the article slug for that. But a lot of the a lot of the validations in our save, for example, actually like have checks for sanity and stuff like that. What's good actually feels like excerpt, which are using things like um, the OG, or the Open Graph data. Um, you know, the, the meta description, stuff like that. So we're, I guess we're kind of, one of the goals of this, we're trying to encourage the journalists to kind of think about this sort of stuff first, rather than the kind of an afterthought. Um, but a lot of that's just done through basically rules on the, uh, on the model, so. Well, good, thank you. Thank you very much, Ray.